Today's episode of the Counseling Tutor Podcast is sponsored by Web Healer. You're a counselor in private practice and you need a website, or you've got an existing website which you need help with. Web Healer are offering Counseling Tutor Podcast listeners, that's you, £100 off the cost of a website design and build. Now, Web Healer specialise in websites for counsellors and psychotherapists. It's what they do. And the Web Healer team provide a completely non technical, done for you solution, leaving you to focus your time on your clients. Operating for 20 years, Web Healer are a trusted resource amongst counsellors when it comes to getting your practice online. So get the package details and claim your £100 off coupon for your new website by going to counsellingtutor.com forward slash website. That's counsellingtutor.com forward slash website. Hi, I'm Rory and welcome to episode 305 of the Counselling Tutor podcast. I'm delighted to catch up with Claire Radcliffe, who has a diploma in integrative counselling. She's a very well qualified TA therapist, completing a number of courses at the Manchester Institute for Psychotherapy. She's also a clinical supervisor and she holds an advanced certificate in couples and relationship counselling. Today, Claire is going to share with us her observations of being a couples counsellor. So with that said, let's get on with today's episode. Welcome to the Counselling Tutor Podcast. The must-listen-to podcast for counsellors, psychotherapists and counselling students. Here are your hosts... Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast. It's episode 305. I, myself, Ken and Rory are delighted to have you here. We have three stops on today's journey. That's what you've come to expect. We're starting, of course, with that ethical, sustainable practice where we're going to be delving into the Equality Act and your counselling practice and speaking about reasonable adjustments. We then go on to practice matters. As uh, Rory has already mentioned, Claire Ratcliffe is going to be reflecting on couples counselling. That is definitely worth a listen. And then we move on to our students services where we're going to be speaking about ethics in counselling and today the specific topic is what do you do about gifts from clients. So interesting uh, episode for you starting 305 counselling under the Equality Act and thinking about reasonable adjustments Rory. Yeah absolutely so certainly in the UK and if you're listening you know maybe in a, in a different country there may very well be equality legislation that you have to follow. And there's a lot of con- countries have similar legislation around equality. And in, in the UK in 2010, um, the government brought together a number of disparate acts, different acts, and put them under one umbrella, which was called the Equality Act. And part of the Equality Act is called reasonable adjustments, making reasonable adjustments Um, for people to be able to access services. So a simple um, explanation of that would be that a lot of buildings now have ramps for wheelchairs, assisted, you know, assisted chairs, so that people can access buildings and they're called reasonable adjustments. But it's quite interesting that in counselling, we too have to consider reasonable adjustments. And I think a good place to start with that is um, neurodivergent clients can. Um, As we've talked about on the podcast many times before, neurodivergence, autism, ADHD, all the the kind of presentations with under the neurodivergent umbrella um, are now presenting more and more in our therapy rooms. And we have to be thoughtful that clients who are neurodivergent may need a reasonable adjustment. So, you know, just as an example, um, noise cancelling headphones so someone might want to bring noise cancelling headphones to a session and pop them on and with noise cancelling headphones as long as you don't play any music you can still hear what people are saying i've got a great pair of noise cancelling headphones again as have you and you can still hear what people say it's just the background noises you know traffic anything that's happened outside are muted considerably 
So it may be that a client says, well, can I put my noise cancelling headphones on? As, as long as they're not attached to music, I think that's a reasonable adjustment, Ken. It is. And, and you know, we're speaking about the 2010 Equality Act here in the United Kingdom. And it basically mandates service providers, and that's exactly what we are as counsellors and, and psychotherapists, to uh, make reasonable adjustments to ensure that any individual that comes in that faces challenges, including those, as you've mentioned, Rory, that are neurodivergent, uh, or even perhaps have maybe expressed some trauma in their lives or some, whatever it is that we pick up, that they are able to access the service effectively um, and it does lie upon us and I guess it means understanding uh, the uh, Equality Act so I would in, I would firstly encourage go and re-look at the Equality Act if you haven't looked at it for some time and of course if you're outside the UK you're going to have an act that governs how equality is uh, is managed and how we present ourselves within that uh, within your country go and have a look at that because well, by looking at that you can kind of get a, a feel for it and I love Rory that you've made a uh, a little handout and we'll point you to that in the moment and you spoke about the uh, adjustment of allowing somebody to maybe wear headphones now it may at first glance look at how can somebody sit there in a counseling relationship wearing a pair of noise cancelling headphones but as you've said rory if you do a little bit of cpd on it you can understand that the headphones are not the person blocking you out they're blocking out the other sounds maybe the the the, the tinkles or clatters or a, a, a mm. ticking clock or noises that may uh, just be uh, ambient noises in the room and if we need to reference that to the Equality Act, it aligns with the actual requirement to make res reasonable adjustments by modifying the environment or providing auxiliary aids, this is quoted from the, the Act, to avoid substantial disadvantages. And of course, we've spoken before, and you only need to go back to our last podcast, we've spoken about kind of looking at uh, how that neurodivergent individual may be disrupted by noises. I know myself, and I shared with my actual uh, autism diagnosis how disruptive it was because there was a massive ticking clock within the room. And there was also, I have to say, Rory, um, uh, lighting that really hurt my eyes. My eyes are sensitive, um, and I'm light and sound sensitive and specifically if I'm stressed or in a new environment um, it it really it really is a bit of a challenge for me and one of the things I'd like to throw in along with your noise cancelling headphones Rory is sunglasses you know if the if the room is particularly bright is it okay for that person you know in in chatting with you and you kind of understanding where it is for them for them to put on a pair of sunglasses and i know i spend m most of my life with a pair of sunglasses on rory so i walk around it can be raining and i'll have sunglasses on and it's not because i'm trying to be a rock star or hide away or be unsociable it's because brightness actually hurts my eyes and it, it, it reduces my points levels it means that i'm concentrating on the pain and not being fully uh, engaged in what's happening within that uh, the the moment Another one that I'd like to take from the handout that you've made, Rory, which is super helpful, I have to say, is session structure. Now, we might think as counsellors, psychotherapists, that a session is fits within an hour and it's 50 minutes because we have five minutes to say hi and five minutes to say bye. And that may even be part of our contract that when somebody sits down, we say this is how it works. Well, is there a reasonable adjustment that needs to be made for certain individuals? Maybe breaking a session to shorter and and more frequent appointments or maybe even putting a little bit of a break in into the session if somebody needs to decompress or they need that break there rory what's your thoughts on that yeah i mean i think <clears throat> i think this is this is essential anyway um certainly for neurodivergent clients they may they may ask us you know can i have a half an hour session or can i just go out and sit outside for 10 minutes and 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 reconvene um, but also for clients who've experienced trauma, they may need to decompress themselves. You know, if they're, if they're talking about something that's happened to them, a traumatic experience, even the most experienced therapist who would help with pace, um, try to try to keep the, the client in a position where uh, they're, they're not reliving the trauma, they're not becoming disassociated. But it may be a client says, you know, I could do, with a break and instead of saying well why don't you come back the next session you know why not just have a break you know why not just stop the client you need to sit in the room and just have a break i've i've done that and just talked about 
general things, the weather, the, you know, the trip into, into town or whatever. And then when they're ready to re-engage, re-engage, they might even want to just sit outside for a minute and just, and just take some time. Um, but these are becoming, I think, more and more prominent. Um, I'm going to use the term interventions now in therapy, where we're having really to look at um, the robustness of our clients and making sure that they don't get overwhelmed or disassociated. So it may seem contrary to what, what we've been taught, but actually um, the world's changing and we need really to meet our clients where they are. Oh, Yes, 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 Rory. Oh, you got me nodding and, and <laughs> fist in the air waving when, when you say that. And, you know, all of this starts um, with with CPD, as we, we've said so often. It's understanding what 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 a person might be presenting with. And, you know, if you if we speak neurodivergence, um, it, it is often called the the lost generation because it certainly wasn't known about when I was at school. It was overlooked and it wasn't seen. And now, even today, we need to do the CPD so that we can see it, so we can have these conversations, conversations with our clients. And really, the, the crux of this is by implementing small little changes um, we're not only going to comply with the legal requirements from the Equality Act, but we're also going to present and foster a more supportive and accessible therapeutic environment that acknowledges and respects the diverse needs of all the people that come to us. And I think that is so, so important. It just underlines everything that we do. And we've just spoken there about maybe uh, adjusting the timelines or the breaks. And we've got a nice reference to the Equality Act on this, where the Act encourages service providers to adapt their practices, including altering the timing and structure of services to accommodate individual needs. And of course, we need to know about those individual needs through our how we do our intake or our assessment mm -hmm. interview to understand where this person is and have the, the training to understand and the openness to discuss with them, you know, uh, things like they might need a break or that the lights might be too too uh, bright or the ticking clock is is you know it's the hidden stuff that we don't necessarily see without the training that is important here and the third topic that you've popped on here Rory is an interesting one it's the advanced preparation and the adjustment on this we're speaking about those adjustments and providing clients with with an agenda or an outline of what's going to be covered in the session how it's going to run and then them having this beforehand so they know what to expect and that can reduce anxiety and help them prepare and i can really relate to this from my own perspective Anything new to me, anything unnew, unknown where I'm going into an environment where I don't know what's going to happen or how it's going to run, I'm anxious before I walk in. When I walk in, I'm wondering what's going to happen and having to adapt on the fly and that uses up. I guess my my resources that could otherwise, if I if I knew what was going to happen, those resources would be focused more on the therapeutic interaction than uh, how long is it going to be? Can I have a break in this? Where are we going to be going? What kind of things will they be asking us? And of course, you've refer referenced it beautifully to the uh, uh, the Equality Act there, and the reference for that is ensuring that the clients are informed about what to expect is a reasonable adjustment under the Act, as it helps those with anxiety cognitive impairments or trauma related difficulties to engage more effectively in the session and i re that one really resonates with me rory yeah and i think this is this is kind of reasonably new in the in the uh, you know in, in the counseling arena um in the past people have just been sent appointments and i think we're now beginning to realize and acknowledge that preparation just just laying the ground out and also normalizing um, issues that clients might have. So if you've got maybe uh, a client who's autistic and they've experienced trauma, um, just normalizing the fact that they can ask for adjustments or they, they may want to take a break or just just putting that in there. So they look at it and they go, oh, well, that's, that's a standard thing for this therapist. Um, and it might be that some people don't want to disclose, you know, their, their neurodivergence or, or in, indeed their, their trauma. When we meet clients, um, sometimes it, 
what happens is during the arc of therapy, uh, things emerge. People tell tell us about their personalities or the way they experience life. They may share about their sexuality or their gender identification. It's not always apparent at the time that someone meets us. There's there's a sense of having to build trust and a sense of security. So anything you can do pre-meeting the client to normalise anything and to make it just, well, you know, if you want to just take a break, that's fine. If you feel you need to you wear sunglasses or noise-cancelling headphones, that's fine. Um, you know, if you word it in a way where it's it makes it kind of that's what happens, then clients are going to be less anxious. They're going to come in and, and sit down and, like you say, Ken, they may have the noise-cancelling headphones on or they may have their fidget toy or they may just say, I'd just like to take five-minute break. You know, heck, I go to the dentist. Even the dentist takes a five-minute break if I get stressed about dental work. So, you know, why not therapists? You know, I think I think we just, again, it comes down to, and I know I keep saying this ad nauseum, meeting the clients where they are oh, yes. and making sure we don't exclude clients, that we don't say, well, you can't be yourself, so don't come to therapy because that's not what we're about. We want people to come to therapy to gain that help to be able to, you know, make themselves well or understand their situation better. Oh yes, oh yes, hundred percent, Rory. And and I guess as as we're speaking about this, it's it's the thought of recognizing that each person is an individual. And we've spoken before on this podcast about things like eye contact. You know, mm. you, for some people, eye contact is challenging and difficult, and they might not want you looking at them or them looking at you you know it's it's a choice and we it's about looking to the to the client to kind of set the pace to set the way but uh, but also i guess having a relook at what is our intake process what does that look like have we just got this standard force form that we've used for years that we just send off that's going to give us the tick boxes in the risk assessment and what are you presenting with for therapy or are we kind of moving with kind of uh, i guess the times if i dare say rory and recognizing mm -hmm. that there that there are individual needs that we can that are more recognized now are we are we giving a place in a in our intake process for that do we have a can we customize our intake process mm. depending on who that person is maybe they're not comfortable to come in and sit down and go straight into their material maybe maybe they need to test the water on a session or two uh, to kind of feel confident enough to be able to share that and of course the, refer the referencing the Equality Act on that, the, the Act requires reasonable adjustments to ensure equal service access. Tailoring the intake process helps accommodate clients who may be overwhelmed by standard procedures, ensuring that they receive the support they need from the, uh, from the outset. So all of this is beautifully linked back and quoted to the, to the Equalities Act. And this is not Rory and I saying this is what you need to do in your practice this is what you need to change we're just having the conversation i think by having the conversation makes us think hmm could i do something differently a am i serving as best i can is there anything i should uh, re look at and and if it does that if this chat that we're having now does that then it's absolutely 100 percent done its job rory i agree you know i mean we're living more progressive times now um you know, a lot of therapy, you know, was developed in the 1950s. And um, you know, the theories have stood the test of time. I think most of the theories have stood the test of time. However, societies change. And, and I think sometimes that's something that's maybe not amplified quite enough in counselling training in that, you know, the, the 1950s society, where counselling was developed. We think of Rogers or Byrne or Beck or, you know, all the, the panion of people who um, developed therapy. Um, we, those people don't exist anymore. And when I say don't exist, those societies don't exist anymore. We, we, are, we live in, you know, the time of this podcast, the 2024 society, which is entirely different. So I do think we have to sometimes... Um, um, not bend, but mould, that would be a good word, mould our practice yep. around what society is. And I think if we do that, we're, we're, we're in the, serving the best interests 
of our clients. And that comes down to those who work online as well. You know, um, being very thoughtful, if you're doing online work, there's a lot of people who are solely online therapists, you know, being thoughtful that, you know, using a video platform may be preferable to um, those people who are aut autistic than using the phone. People, who, Some people who are autistic don't like the phone. They like the visual connection. So it's it's about being thoughtful at every every level and making sure that um, you're inviting your clients in. I wonder, Ken, you know, how many clients look at some directory listings and think, I'd like to work with that client, but I'd love to work with that therapist, but... I'm not sure they kind of get me and my and my kind of idiosyncrasies. I yep. wonder how often that happens. And then therapy is never undertaken and that person just lives a life in difficulty. Yeah, uh, very, very much so. So, I mean, we've mentioned before that we uh, run uh, training and Rory is build, building at this very moment um, neurodivergence training for counsellors in order for us to be able to better serve uh, our clients. And What's interesting is we've had uh, discussions in our leadership, academic leadership team of how the assessment process might look on this. And part of that assessment process is recognizing, you know, maybe part of the assessment process is taking the learning and then putting that into words that can go on your website so that when the client does look, they can go, mm, OK, maybe this person can work with me and my idiosyncrasies. Maybe part of that process is, is uh, examining how you might change your profile for it to stand out and be different from someone else who's just uh, kind of uh, putting what they do and how they do it out there. So there's a lot to consider in there. And I, I liked how you were talking about the theories and where they come from, the original theories that we kind of work to. And they, they are from the past. There's, the, there's no denying mm. that. And what's wonderful is so much of that theory stands today. It works today. Those those uh, processes work today. But also when we're training as therapists, we learn equality and diversity. It's part of our training. It's an important part of any uh, counseling training. But the thing is, equality and, and and diversity is changing all the time. It is not static um, at all. And I was, uh, I was watching recently, I was going back to a program I used to watch as a much younger man, Rory. It's called Spin City. It was an American program with Michael J. Fox back in the day where he was uh, heading up the news department or the, the information department of uh, the New York mayor's office, and they would spin everything to, to kind of put it out. But it was interesting for me to watch that there was a disclaimer at the very beginning of that process. So we're probably talking, what, 90s, early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, that that was on the televisions live when I was watching it. The disclaimer that comes up now is dated comedy. This comedy this comedy was sitcom was made uh, at a different time and it's kind of excusing itself because it's recognizing that it maybe does not match the culture of today and the same is true with the, with the with uh, equality and diversity in our own practices unless we're undertaking the cpd doing the continuous training to understand how culture is changing and moving and morphing uh, then we're less able to i like how you said it rory mold our practice around it and as counselors i think we don't aim to be fixed in our ways and this is the way that we do it uh, we want to be led by our clients and we want to best serve our clients. And I think equality and diversity, revisiting that uh, Equality Act and thinking about reasonable adjustments, what can we do in our practice? I think that's a, a, a beautiful way to do it, Rory. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, as we kind of round this topic up, uh, I had a little trip into, into directories and... Um, um, what was really interesting is there are still people use the term BAME, um, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic. I work with the BAME client group. And actually, um, there's lots there's lots of changes in the language now. So, you know, if you're using that term, it's, it's actually outdated. And it actually goes to the root of what we're discussing here, which was how fast things change and why CPD is important. You know, if you are outwardly attracting clients language now has become really really important and how you you know not only how you use the language but actually exampling how you apply diversity in your 
practice. It's, it's no good to say I'm a diverse counsellor. I work with diverse clients groups. How do you work with them? You know, what would a diverse client ex expect from you? All those things are really important because, you know, I, I, I think I'm right in saying, Ken, that counselling has become of age to a point now where counselling clients are now consumers and they're consuming therapy and yeah. they're becoming very nuanced in who they look for, very nuanced in who they look for. It's not a case of I'm going to find a counsellor. I think a lot of people are saying I want to kind of find a counsellor that fits for me. I want one that understands my uniqueness. I want a counsellor who may be, you know, trauma-informed. Um, so really, really important that, you know, when we're talking about diversity and, and we're putting that on our, you know, our, our listings, that we give examples, not just the, the, you know, what we are, but how we apply it and the language we use around it. I like that, Rory. And if you'd like to get Rory's super duper ha handout, Counselling Under the Equality Act, that really looks at those um, uh, those adjustments that we can make, uh, you can get that by going to counsellingtutor.com. Click on the podcast tab, make your way to episode 305. That's this episode 305. And you can download it. It's right there. It speaks about sensory modifications, session structure, advanced preparation, the use of technology within the counseling room, uh, customized intake process. It has a beautiful reference at the bottom there. And it gives a little blurb and a preamble taking you in, getting you to think about reasonable adjustments within your practice and that is today's ethical sustainable practice and as we move from our ethical sustainable practice straight into practice matters this is the cpd section of the counseling tutor podcast where we get kind of get to a peek into somebody else's practice and what they think and how they work and rory i know you spoke with uh, claire ratcliffe recently on reflections on couples counseling Indeed, and I think that it's really, really interesting. I went to a supervision conference a few weeks ago, um, and one of the things that came up was supervising couples, and it is it is a growing area. I caught up with Claire Radcliffe, who's a really well-experienced uh, therapist and couples counsellor, and this is what she had to say about the growth and the world of couples counselling. Practice Matters is proudly sponsored by the Counselor CPD Library. To access top quality, relevant continuing professional development for your practice that you can do at a time that suits you and all for less than the price of a cup of coffee, visit counsellingtutor.com. There are many different ways of practicing counselling and psychotherapy. And I guess the traditional way is two people in a room um, where you're working with a single person, which is why I'm delighted today to be speaking with Claire Ratcliffe, who is a psychotherapist and is a couples counsellor. And she's going to tell us just a little bit about the differences between working with couples and working with individuals and just a little bit about her practice. So Claire Ratcliffe, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Rory. It's a pleasure. And I guess the first question um, is, what what was it that attracted you to working with couples? Because uh, you, I, I presume like a lot of therapists, you trained um, to work with individuals and then you transitioned to be a couples counsellor. So what was it that kind of sparked that transition? Well, what happened was I actually started training in couples counselling. So I did four years training and I actually started training in couples counselling straight after. So as soon as I qualified as a counsellor, I went on then to train in couples counselling and I did nine months of training. But to be honest, at the time, I didn't feel fully equipped to be working with couples, to be honest. A few years later, I went on then to train in transactional analysis psychotherapy. So I did four years then. Um, while I was um, learning more about TA and dynamic relationships and things like that, I went on to do further couples therapy training um, in various different modalities. And now I enjoy it more than I did in 2013, put it that way. <laughs> so so what, what, what would you say the balance of your practice is if you, if you looked at how many, how, many, how many clients you had that were couples and how many clients you had that were individuals is it about 50 50 or is it more or less 
Well, I work with individuals, I work with couples, and I'm also a supervisor. So I trained as a supervisor um, and qualified in 2015. So really broken down there, I see, I do see um, quite a few individuals, but I, I think the inquiries that I get are so many more like from couples. I probably get percentage-wise 70% couples inquiries. And when I supervise um, therapists, sometimes um, I work with therapists who work with individuals and couples, but quite often I do get therapists who contact me who have already got a supervisor for their individual work, but they'll say they want a couple's supervisor just for the couple's work. So really percentage-wise, I probably see 20% supervisees, maybe 30% individuals, and then the rest couples. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's, that's an interesting mix. And, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just taken by the point in terms of a commercial, um, a commercial aspect to your, your practice. You, the, the biggest set of inquiries is for couples, peop, couples who want to um, see you as opposed to individuals. Um, I think that's quite interesting. It certainly was something that I noticed in, the, in, in, in my practice when I practised that I had more inquiries for couples than I did from individuals. And I often mused, I often wondered why that was. Have you any thoughts on that? You know, I think now, I, I do think that now couples are seeking more support and there's not as much stigma as there used to be. I think with relationships in the past, it would be don't share your troubles, don't say that you're struggling, put on a front of everything's going okay and I think now people are actually more open to talking about the difficulties that you experience because being in a relationship or being married it isn't easy you know it is work because it's two individuals working at creating a life together and that isn't always going to be you know sunshine and roses and everything else you're going to come across difficulties and challenges and now I just think there's more out there that people feel comfortable to access that support so Definitely over the last few years, um, couples' inquiries have been through the roof. Um, and I think it's really great because I, I do think couples need the support. I mean, I'm saying couples a lot. I do work as well with relationships where it consists of more than two people. So sometimes there are three people in the relationship um, or it's you know, a polyamorous relationship. But couples definitely um, are looking for more support now in the relationship, I think. And there is less so sometimes I'll get an inquiry and they'll say, I've been past your details by such and such body who had couples therapy with you three years ago. So friends are now talking to one another. Do you see a therapist? Oh, we were seeing this person. And so I think maybe quite a few years ago, people didn't really tell that they were having support for the relationship as much as they do now. Yes, I, I would agree. And I, I think there's an aspect of women's voices being heard as well. Um, you know, certainly my, my, my in my generation, um, when I when I grew up, when I was young, uh, women's voices weren't as um, validated, and women were discounted a lot. There's a huge amount of sexism, and now what I'm seeing, and I'm pleased to see it as the as the father of uh, a daughter and the grandfather of a do a granddaughter, the women's voices are 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 being heard, being validated, and uh, there's more kind of. I, I, the sense I get, and it's not the same for every relationship, but the sense I get, there's more of an equality within relationships. There's more of a conversation going on about how to push them forward. Certainly in the, the people I meet, certainly my friends, and um, I don't think I'm, I'm alone in that it is, as you say, a work in progress. And people who are invested in relationships are looking for looking for that support. It's, it's a, um, I guess it's kind of a, a, quite a modern phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when you do have like the couple who are coming to you as well, they're bringing their whole history. So quite often that will still be very present in the relationship with the couple because their history might look like their mother could never say what was happening for them. Or they might have had a parent who was very passive, a very conflict avoidant family. And that then becomes very present in the couple who I'm working with because they will say, well, this is how I saw a relationship was when I was younger. This is how you know, I'm responding in the same way that one of my parents did, which is where transactional analysis is actually excellent because there's so much around that when you're looking at the history um, and how this dynamic unfolds then in your relationship. So it, um, 
that still happens and it's how you work with that to make the quieter person in the relationship to speak up and find their voice more and the one who's perhaps a little bit more louder to listen and slow things down so you're looking really to make change that's not just in their present but it's kind of looking at their whole histories and how they can have a different view on what a relationship can look like and what they want to create yeah absolutely and i think that's interesting isn't it i've I've said on the podcast many times we're all stretched out kids and um you know we're all kind of elastic children that kind of elastic ourselves into um adulthood and we bring with us a lot of the experiences of childhood and certainly other, other relationships into our relationships and sometimes um that needs adjusting because what we see may not always be be healthy and I guess the model of parent, adult, and child can be mightily useful when you're working with with uh, couples. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And you know, TA was designed to be easily accessible for people to use. The diagrams and everything in the descriptions are easily accessible, so you can kind of teach someone that um, within the session, and they go away and use. I'll often have clients who come back and say, I noticed when I was in my parent ego state, when I was telling them to do this and that, and then I realised, what am I doing? I sound like my mom. if I want my relationship to be equal, I need to speak in this way. Um, And I look when they come back and tell me the things that they've implemented in between the sessions and things like that. I think TA is absolutely fantastic working with couples. I do also, my training, so the main... um, training really for couples at the moment that I use is the developmental model by Ellen Bader and Pete Pearson so I've been training in that um, and I'm just now as of the end of this month going into the advanced training group um, that is an excellent model as well to work with and a lot of that does relate to TA well so um, that's a really good way I think of working with couples yeah so there are lots of different uh, different modalities just like in 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 one to one therapy with, with there's lots of modalities but there seems to be quite quite a few modalities within um within couples therapy within your um model how would you say it may differ from from other models what what are the what are the differences or what is the core idea well when when working with couples, I really wanted to get a good grasp of so many different modalities to see what works well. And they're all, they're all you know, they all have the benefits, really. There's different things that I take from each one. I've been on a few different training courses. But the developmental model, that one is actually based on the developmental stages that the couple goes through in the relationship that are very similar and align with the stages of childhood development. So Margaret Marler, who um, has, has all the different stages of life, symbiosis and separation and individual, um, all the developmental stages um, within your childhood is almost taken there and put in your relationship when a couple first meet and they're in that symbiotic stage they find every single thing that they have in common so they're like oh i like chinese food oh so do i i like chinese food anything that creates a bond that look how similar we are look at the things that we both like look at the things that we don't like and they create that type bond which is good that's needed that's how it is with the child and the parent creating that symbiotic bond and then you go into so margaret marlow would describe it as like the separation individuation and in couples it's differentiation where you're discovering yourself and um learning what your own thoughts feelings desires are and expressing that to your partner and actually that can create difficulties because now we realize there are differences between us Um, So it goes on really to all the different stages. Um, And when you have a couple who come in, they might be in different stages. So you're working really of how they can develop within the relationship, the same way that the child develops through their childhood is. How fascinating. I mean, it sounds sounds like you're obviously working with two processes in the room. And, Uh um, And I guess my next question would be, you know, how how is that transition as a as a as a single therapist working with someone just in front of you to transition into working with two processes <clears throat> are there any kind of challenges with that that you had to you had to navigate along the way it really can be challenging at times when you're working with the individual they're bringing 
whatever <clears> it is that they're talking about in terms of their relationships with other people and you're hearing it from their perspective which is great because that is all you need you don't need the other person's perspective in order to see what your client's experience is and how they are within relationships whether that's with like romantic partners or colleagues friends family um and really you're working with them discovering their own individuality and being able to express their feelings needs and find their voice um and to go on and live a life that they feel truly like happy and fulfilled with and with the couple yes they might be at different um developmental stages each of them and really what i look with i look at with the couple is what do you want your relationship to look like and how far away are you from that what is it that you are bringing to the relationship what are you doing in the relationship what do you want to stop doing and it's really looking I do say with all couples, you are learning about your relationship and you are learning about one another. But I really think the main thing in couples therapy is you learn a lot about yourself. You are going to go on self-discovery journey in this couple's work and not only learn how to be a better partner, but find all the missing parts within yourself that you haven't been able to or express parts that are hidden parts that you're ashamed of you're going to learn so much about yourself and that is what i love about the couple's work because it is such a huge journey on self-discovery and that absolutely helps develop and grow your relationship and help it to flourish so it can be tricky when you come in at different stages and one saying i feel smothered by them because they don't want me to go and see my friends and then so i want to run away from that and then the other one saying, yeah, but I find it just feel like you don't care about me when you don't spend time with me. Okay, maybe this is something then to work on that you're both in a different um, stage. One of you might still be in the symbiosis stage and the other's in differentiation. Let's, I don't like use those terms too much. <laughs> what terms like that, if I'm going to give a description of what it is and a bit of theory around what it is, and some actually find that really helpful. And then work with them with different exercises <laughs> in order to develop that to find what it's like for them to make some of these changes um so i do really love that yeah and uh, on that kind of topic of self-discovery on that theme of self-discovery i'm guessing that therapy is a very safe space for a person to disclose something that they may not have disclosed to their partner before being in a therapeutic environment they they may they may have struggled sharing an aspect of their life that, that that they've kept closed off from their partner. Is that something that you see quite frequently? Absolutely, I think when you come to couples therapy, it is a really vulnerable thing to do because you are allowing yourself to be seen by your partner in ways that you might not have been before. And that whole being seen and accessing these parts that you might have disavowed and shut away can be really hard. Because if your nervous system is saying it's not safe to be seen because historically it wasn't safe to be seen. And if I share this part of myself that's been really shaming in my past, I might get rejected. What I reveal, my partner might not like. What if they see me differently? What if they leave me? There's so much fear that comes up with that, that people are afraid to do that. So creating safety is really important, but it doesn't mean that that person feels safe. I could say, this couple session is completely safe. It's confidential. I'm here to hold you and all of that. It doesn't matter if that person's nervous system is saying, but last time you expressed something, your parent threatened to divorce your other one or whatever because our nervous system holds absolutely everything Mm. from our history and it will find you last time you did that look what happened um so it's really hard then actually to express that in the couples session but it's a really wonderful experience when the person does do that and their partner is empathic and is caring and wants to be there for them and that doesn't always happen initially at the beginning if it is a very distressed couple or there's a lot of hostility a lot of anger and resentment because it's hard then to access your empathy Mm. so i would not encourage someone to reveal so much about themselves if i knew the empathy wasn't really there from the other i would invite them to see if they could access some of that empathy if and work with that um because if there's so much resentment it's hard to say 
you know, I really feel that for you and I'll give you a hug if actually they've not hugged each other in a year and they hated each other. Um, it's really tough. So that can be difficult, but when they do start to access that vulnerability and it's really knowledge for the partner, it can be a lovely experience. Yeah, and, and I guess that... I guess there'll be some couples who just come to the conclusion that they go their separate ways, that, you know, they've grown apart. And how does th- how does couples therapy um, support and facilitate that? That can definitely happen. So I've worked with people who have <clears throat> decided that they're going to separate and then they still have some sessions while they're going through the separation. A lot of people do that mainly if they have children. Mm. So if they don't have children, couple of sessions and then but they do sometimes they'll stay a little bit longer to work through um how they're still because they're still going to be communicating with each other because they have kids um but i've also you know worked in relationships where they've come to me saying we've separated we're coming towards the end of our divorce now we're just at the final stage but we want to learn how to communicate better because we have children together and then after actually learning the um how to communicate in a more effective way they've said right we decided to actually stay together and the divorce is off the table now we're actually getting back together oh my god um but it's it definitely can be that way and i do um that is really important really to acknowledge that not every couple comes to couple therapy and decide to stay together some do realize the right thing for me to do is leave this relationship um and that isn't a bad thing. I think you've come to a decision then that's right. You've listened to yourself, your own internal voice, you know, and a true internal voice. So I don't mean like the critical parent voice and making a decision from that or the scared child voice or anything like that. You've made, you've really thought about this and you've come to a decision that feels absolutely right for you. And that's all to be celebrated. I mean, you're not going to be there like popping balloons and all that for, for them in the session, but it is to, to be celebrated that actually they've discovered what they truly want and it might not be this relationship but unless you work through if you don't learn what's happened in that relationship and how you've been and what you've brought to it you're going to probably take it into your next relationship so um that is something then to work on individually as well so that you're not carrying the same thing into every relationship that you enter into it sounds like a um you know some some of the work's almost magical you know you 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 gave us that um pastiche if you like of um a couple who are getting divorced and then they come to couple therapy and they find themselves again um there's something there's something quite quite wonderful in that um one final question you know there'll be people who are listening the listener as we like to call them out there maybe listening and thinking i'd like to train as a couple therapist what kind of um observations would you give someone what would you give what would you ask someone to think about before they signed up to do a couple's training course okay so there are many different train courses out there there are so many i've probably been on half of them because i, I finish one and start another so i've learned lots from different different approaches and they some are similar they have different links and others are so different in terms of their approach or the directiveness so i find one that aligns well with you and it's okay to train in a couple so that you've got more um information and more steadiness really within your practice because you are going to have couples who come in who are highly distressed you want to feel like you are potent and can deal with that and take a lead on that because sometimes you really do have to take a bit of a lead in order to facilitate in the beginning maybe um before they can communicate really effectively and well and then you take a bit more of a step back and allow them to do that because then of course they're going to go out and do that in the real world so you want them to do that without you you're not always going to be there um but what i what i did so when i did that first initial training in 2013 um, I trained nine months with that particular um, modality and it didn't really fit right with me. So I went and read lots of different books about couple therapy, all different approaches. I really love Imago. So I did some Imago training, but I'm not a certified Imago therapist. But I really love um, a lot of the aspects of that. So I do um, take that. There's a lot of books. Um, Harville Hendricks has written a couple of books on um, Imago therapy. Those are really helpful. Um find something that you feel works 
well for you. When I read In Quest of the Mythical Mate, which is based on the developmental model, and I also have another book called Tell Me No Lies, um, so that's Ellen Bader and Pete Pearson. I love that. And I felt that same feeling that I felt when I discovered transactional analysis. I thought, this resonates. This is what I want to learn more about. And then um, some of the couples training courses will offer a one or two day workshop to get a feel of it before you go on to do the full training. So that is um, a really good option, I think. Um, also, what I would say, if you're going to be trained as a couple therapist, I think it's really important to have a supervisor who is a couples therapist and who has had couples therapy training. So when I very first did it, my supervisor was not trained in couples. And when I would take things to them, some of the things they were like, oh, I'm not really sure how you deal with a situation like mm -hmm. that. Or they get mixed up in transference. And some of the advice I was given or information actually wasn't that great for me at the time. So now, I mean, I, I have three supervisors now because I have them for different things, but I have one who is solely couples therapist. She specializes in it. She writes books about it. She is absolutely fantastic. I go to her and take my couples to her. So I do think it's important to have a supervisor who works with couples because um, it is a different way of working. Um, but there's so many books out there now that you could read through and see which one really feels like something I would enjoy working with. And there's loads of couples training courses out there, and I love so many of them. <laughs> well, I think those on, on those very wise words, Claire, will bring the interview uh, to an end. If you want to know Claire's details, if you go to Counselling Tutor, um, find the podcast tab, uh, go to episode 306 on counsellingtutor.com. Um, we'll put some uh, details of Claire and her practice where you can reach out to her. Um, should you uh, sh should you want couples therapy, and uh, as uh, as always, there's a close. Claire Ratcliffe, thank you so much for joining us. Massive thank you to our guest Claire Ratcliffe, and of course to you, Rory, our super duper host, who held the <laughs> conversation, bringing us the good stuff, and of course going out and doing the groundwork. Rory, I've got to say thank you for that. You go to these conferences, look out the speakers that make an impact and have something interesting to say, and you bring them to our audience here at Counselling Tutor, and we're so grateful for that. I know I am anyway. And that was our practice matters. Don't forget to pop that down on your CPD tracker, <laughs> and we now move on. To to our student services. Student services is sponsored by Counseling Skills Academy. Have you ever wondered if you're using counseling skills effectively? Confidentiality means we rarely see skills used by others, so it's no wonder that so many students say they lack confidence in their counseling skills. That's why I built Counseling Skills Academy. Counseling Skills Academy is an online course that you can do at your own pace. It will give you the skills competence and confidence to know that you're using your skills most effectively. You will see real counseling skills used by a counselor in real life sessions covering everything from how risk is assessed right through to working towards an appropriate ending. Visit counselingskillsacademy.com to learn more and to claim your counselling tutor discount. That's counsellingskillsacademy.com. Student Services, of course, recognising you, the student, on your journey, on your formal journey to become a counsellor. And one of the things that comes up quite a lot is what do I do if my client offers me a gift? Rory, what do you do? Oh gosh! Well, I mean, I think I think I think it's good to paint some background. When when Ken and myself taught, um, uh, we would have occasionally the odd student would hang back, maybe it's a break, and then come up to us and say with it with brevity, um, "I've got I've got I've got something to uh, ask you." What a, a client bought me a box of chocolates, and um, and say well, very very good, and he. he I think a lot of students get very, very worried and very hung up about gifts and how they should deal with gifts. And I've got to be honest, I've changed my position over the, oh, well, I've changed my position a good few years ago. Um, I was kind of taught that you shouldn't really accept gifts, but I began to appreciate that a, a gift could be part of the therapeutic relationship. It could be a client saying, thank you for all, all you've done. And it's the appropriate 
uniqueness of the gift, not the gift itself that's really important. So if you're a student and you're listening to this and you're wondering what gifts you can receive, my observation would be, first of all, if you're working for an agency, which a lot of students are working within an agency, go to the practice manager and ask if they've got a policy on gifting. Because I know that um, when I worked for Mind as a student, it was many years ago now, um, we had a gifting book. And anybody who gave a gift, you'd say, thank you very much, and that's very kind, and that's lovely. And then when the clients had gone, you would go to the practice manager, show the gift, put it in the gifting book. If it was a box of chocolates, you could leave it on the reception and let all, all the other staff um, have a chocolate, which was always nice. There always chocolates on the uh, reception when I worked there. Or you could take it on yourself. If it was something a little bit more, um, shall we say, personal, like a, like a ring or a charm or a bracelet, then the practice manager would kind of take a view on the value of it and um, say to the person, well, you know, that's a lovely gift. We'll put it in the, we'll put it in the book. You take it. That's, that's fine. If it was something where someone had left you the deeds to their house or the keys to their car, then I think we're into a different conversation again. And, um, or, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put you in their will. It, I, I've known it happen once, and it's spoke so many years ago, who who the client said, I'm going to put you in my will and leave you some money. That then becomes difficult. And um, that takes a little bit of negotiating. But as a student, I think your first part, part of call is the practice manager, the policies and procedures of your organisation, and then, of course, supervision. Um, because I think that if you're working as a student, you're working usually for free. And... Um, to get a gift at the end of it, I think is 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 just so affirming to the therapist. I know we're giving people, but just to have something come back to us unsolicited, um, I think can can make a great deal of difference. Certainly, if you're going through the 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 long haul of being a student, just to have someone say thank you um, and and give you a box of chocolates or a bunch of flowers or something, a little a card or something like that. I think he's he's wonderful and, and sometimes can make it all worthwhile, Ken. Very much so. I like that you you suggested the first place to look is speak to the practice manager, look at your policies, because um, it may be that no gifts may be received within the agency. I've certainly, w certainly worked myself in, in organisations where there was no gifting. Um, you, you need to know where you stand on that. It, it, it's a two-sided coin I'm going to go with here. Yes, it is a, a affirming, as you said, Rory, to receive something. I mean, we don't expect it. There's, there's no expectations, not what we do counselling for. We don't do it for the gifts that we might receive. Um, but but it can be affirming. It can be very pleasant. It can come as a surprise, and it, and, and it can be a lovely gesture. Um, and I think back to when I was a younger man, <clears throat> I used to struggle with compliments. I worked in entertainment for some years, and, and when people would compliment me, it made me very uncomfortable. I would just try to squirm out of it. And I learned that the best way to handle it is to actually just say thank you very much, because I was looking <laughs> at it from my perspective, from my frame of reference of, oh, don't shine attention on me, just, you know, I was just doing my job, thank you very much, but kind of, shh, this was back as, 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 as an entertainer. But it was reframed for me when, when somebody suggested, think about what it means from their perspective. You know, from their perspective, they've prepared these words or this sentence to deliver to me. And, um, you know, that they, they want to give me something that is very precious, in, in, even if it's just that compliment in, in their words. And just by smiling warmly and saying, thank you, thank you very much, I really appreciate that, that is a great way of receiving something. Um, absolutely, absolutely, Kim. So, so the, the, the other side of the coin is, as you said, Rory, and the, the reason, I guess, why gifting has got the, dare I say, a stigma around it. I bet you if you jump, jump into the Facebook group and start speaking about uh, gifting, you're going you're gonna to have people in both camps here. And, and gifting, it can become, and I'm thinking back at school when the, in the last day, you know, you sat there and then a, a child will go and put something on the teacher's desk, a little package. And then another child will go and put an even bigger one on the table and somebody else will put something on it. And, and, and if I didn't bring anything, I would start feeling like, oh, I've done something wrong. You're supposed to, to give a gift. And that's kind of a 
unwritten expectation that one gives a gift to the teacher at the end of the year and maybe some can't afford it so that's one side of 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 the coin of where it it can run in when when there's almost like this expectation of it the other side is as you said Rory you know we're in a very privileged position as a counselor as a psychotherapist we may have a person that has a life breakthrough where suddenly uh, they're in a completely different place that they were and for them they want to leave you their house because you've made such a big difference in their life and of course that is not appropriate it's not appropriate for them and it's not appropriate for for us to to receive that so it's about um i, I guess making making the decision of how it's going to be for you in your practice and why and where those limits may sit but I do remember us, Rory, speaking about this very same topic in a, in, a, in, in a podcast where a gift that was given by somebody happened to be a Rolex watch. It was not counselling or psychotherapy. And I wonder if you no. can delve into the archives, Rory, uh, of your memories <laughs> and tell us that story. Because when I say a gift of a Rolex watch, it instantly within me brings up that's inappropriate. But when it's framed within how you're going to tell this story, it wasn't inappropriate at all. Yeah, so it was many, many years ago when I worked in the commercial world. I was at a, um, I was at an exhibition. So I think long-term listeners of the podcast will know that I used to work in the photographic industry. And as part of that, I would attend um, kind of uh, events or launches or um, exhibitions where people would exhibit their wares and where the company I worked for exhibited their their products. Um, <clears throat> one day I was I was sat in, I can't remember what it was now. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say it was a product launch. It was a, a camera company's product launch. And I sat next to a guy and um I said to him, it, it was it was it was for journalists, members of the public, um, people in the trade. So very diverse group. Of, of, of people in terms of who got to see the launch of this new product and he had a very smart rolex watch and i said oh that's a lovely rolex watch and he said it was a gift and i said who from and he said the sultan of brunei and i said why did the sultan of brunei give you a rolex watch and uh, apparently this chap I, I won't go into exactly what he did but he worked for the sultan of brunei for a period of time and at the end of the engagement where he worked with the sultan of brunei um, the Sultan, well, the Sultan himself didn't give them out, but his um, his assistants handed out uh, boxes and he opened his and he had a Rolex wristwatch. And I said, well, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. So, you know, that's, that's a lovely gift. And they are very expensive. And to which he kind of laughed and said, do you know how much the Sultan of Brunei is worth? And I said, no, and it's a substantial amount of wealth. I mean, it's just eye-watering. And he said, it's the equivalent of someone giving me, a, you know, a chocolate bar in terms of value. Now, I, I don't want to uh, diminish the Sultan of Brunei's generosity here. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, he gave it out in, in good faith. But in terms of the impact on the wealth of the individual, it was it was negligible. It was literally like buying someone a bag of sweets. Um, but obviously for this guy, it was great because he got himself a very expensive Rolex watch. And I think that some of the, some of the times when we're, when we're receiving gifts, one of the things we have to take on board is who's giving us the gift and what is the means yes. of them giving a gift? So, you know, if I'm working with someone who's in, you know, sort of reduced circumstances and they give me a gold chain, um, you know, that's very different, I think, from somebody who who is in, you know, better circumstances who might do that. I mean, either way, it's 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 a very difficult dilemma. And I I think when it comes to gifting, you have to have your eggs in the eggs, you have to have your ducks, not eggs, ducks. <laughs> I'm thinking of something else. Ducks. <laughs> you, you have to have your du eggs and ducks. Ducks in a row. You have to have a clear policy in your mind and it you know as ken said that policy may come from the organization the organization may take the weight off you there and say look it's just no gifting or have a gifting book or have a policy of it so if someone does offer you a gift you can say that's so kind thank you so much um you know but the organization um won't, won't allow us and sometimes you know we would we would um send things to the charity shop 
and um, you know, mine had a charity shop, and we'd send we'd send stuff over there. So um, I think that it's it's about it's about being clear in your in the policies and procedures, and certainly if you're a student, that's about your organisation, what gifting is, and if you get a gift that feels a little uncomfortable, I think I would. I would act on that. If someone gives you a box of chocolates, well, that's lovely. If someone gives you something that's rather more expensive, then maybe you need to need to speak to someone, your supervisor or the practice manager. Can be a very, very difficult area, I have to say, Ken. It is. It's a nuanced topic. It it, it requires mm. thinking. It's why we're speaking about it. We're certainly not saying you should do this or you shouldn't do that. No, no. We're, we're saying have a think about gifting because what you don't want to do is be in the position where you might be at the end of a session uh, with with a, a uh, in, in your placement counselling and somebody gives you a gift and then they're right there in the moment you caught unawares, you caught by surprise and you go, what do I do now? Can I take this? Do I have to give this back? What do I do? So it's about thinking about it. And if there isn't a policy within uh, the um, place you're doing your placement, well, have a think about it and, and still have the conversation with the practice manager and say, you know, this is what I was thinking and how does that fit? Is that OK? And remember, it's your practice. And of course, there is another side to gifts as well. And it's the motivation behind the gift. We can't see what the motivation is. Mm -hmm. But like you said, Rory, a box of chocolates, lovely, a chocolate bar, lovely, things like that. But it may be inappropriate at times. It might be a bunch of red roses because... The, the the client may feel an attraction towards the counsellor and is yes. kind of trying to make a, a romantic gesture. It's a really interesting and nuanced topic. We can't go into every single aspect no. of every, every 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 gift, but it's worth having a think about what that might look like in your practice as a student, as you can go, go into placement and beyond, Rory. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think it's I think it's one of the things that um one gets used to the, the gifting and, and appreciation from clients i think you, you develop a um a way of working a way of working with that and um you know if i ever receive a gift my final thoughts on this if i ever receive a gift from a client the first person i go to is my supervisor and explore what what that is um and um, and the meaning of it and um, the appropriateness of it. Um, I have to say, I have to make full disclosure. I think I've I've had a couple of gifts through the years, and both were heartfelt. Um, one was kind of one was kind of um, ironically humorous. Someone gave me a someone gave me a bin bag of toilet rolls, and uh, because they'd used so many tissues in the session, and we'd had to, we'd run out of tissues, so we had to use toilet rolls. They were clean. They were new. They were in a packet, and. Um, um, at the end of the session, she came in with a, a bag of toilet rolls and said, as, as I've used all the toilet rolls in the... When I was a student, when, as I've used all the toilet rolls, I brought you some. And uh, I had to go dutifully put that in the gifting yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's lovely, isn't it? Because it's relevant to what the journey yeah. we've taken together. It was it was good-humoured gift yes. uh, to you. I like that, Rory. Yeah. Yeah, and and of course they went into the they went into the stock cupboard um, of the of the organisation, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's lovely to it's lovely to be recognised, and um, also you know I think that it is a two way street um, therapy, and and to have acknowledgement from the client to you about you know how you've worked with the client, your non judgmental approach. Um, you know, the fact you've given time, I, I think is rewarding in itself. It's just we have to be a little bit thoughtful. Indeed. Thank you, Rory. So this has been episode 305 of the Counselling Tutor Podcast. Yes, we started off with ethical, sustainable practice, and we talked about counselling under the Equality Act or any other legis legislative acts that might cover equality Different countries may have different rules around this, but some useful observations and uh, ones that can be easily um, applied in your practice. In Practice Matters, we caught up with Claire Ratcliffe and she talks about her experience of couples counselling, valuable information, and um, I think an interesting, um, an interesting departure from the usual interviews we have where we talk about people counselling individuals 
Claire, Claire's discussion, this description of couples counselling I thought was incredibly useful and uh, may open new avenues up for people who want to go down the route of being a couples counsellor. And then finally, student services, we touch the thorny issue of gifting from clients. How, how does one receive a gift? What might one have to think about? And, uh, and uh, the, the procedures that we might have to uh, implement just to make sure we're staying on the right side of being ethical and finally i'd like to thank everybody who has left a five-star review on our itunes um podcast page if you are um listening to this on uh, itunes or any other podcast platform why don't you leave us a nice five-star review it's always uh, raises the spirits of myself and ken to see how much we've we've been able to help or to get some feedback from you um and also if you find that our conversation has been helpful for you why not share it with someone else why not pop it onto someone's timeline or email it to a friend uh, who may be a therapist so they can hear the podcast and uh, and get the value that you've got from our conversation and um, it's always a pleasure to be part of your journey in counseling whether you be a student or a qualified practitioner or even someone who might just be listening and considering joining and starting on the journey so until next time stay grounded and stay safe thank you for listening to the counseling tutor podcast Find the show notes for this episode by visiting counsellingtutor.com.